and a very warm welcome to this short act of worship led by members of St John the Baptist Episcopal Church in Perth on this the fourth Sunday in Epiphany. As some of you will know, our rector Graham is not with us today as he is recovering at home from treatment on an eye condition. But I'm sure he will be listening and so Graham, to you we assure you of our love and prayers and look forward to your return. And now let us begin our service with the collect for today. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is, def is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. No one is his neighbor, all alone he eats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am lonely too. Make me friend or stranger, fit to is raging, raging in the streets, where injustice spirals and all hope retreats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am angry too. In the kingdom's causes, let me rage with 
of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark chapter 1 beginning at verse 21. Glory to Christ our Saviour. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise to Christ our Lord. In today's gospel from Mark, we heard a dramatic statement about Jesus. Verse 22, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's important to recall that Jesus has just arrived at the synagogue in Capernaum. He has been invested with the power of the Holy Spirit at his baptism by John in the Jordan. He has successfully confronted Satan in the wilderness, preaching the reign of God. And in this passage, his public ministry has just begun. He is teaching in front of some disciples and the established teachers of the law. What captures attention is the manner of his teaching this early in his ministry. He teaches unlike anything heard before and with impressive authority. Amongst those listening carefully to Jesus' words were the revered scribes and Pharisees. Until that moment, they had possessed ultimate spiritual authority. They were the accepted brokers of truth. Probably everyone was waiting to hear their traditional interpretations of scripture. And yet, here is Jesus doing what he would often do, overturning people's expectations. Jesus is teaching not as the scribes, but as one teaching with a different authority, such power and authority that the onlookers are amazed beyond anything previously witnessed. Verse 27, they were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. It is of course the power and authority rooted and flowing into Jesus from God. We can deduce Jesus' powerful teaching will not necessarily make people comfortable. Eventually, it will challenge the accepted power of the Pharisees and scribes. But Jesus' power will also be used for healing and transformation. This is illustrated in the miraculous release of an individual from demonic possession. Ultimately, Jesus' power and authority, both in his teaching and his actions, are for everyone's benefit, both in their present lives and for the day when they stand in judgment before God, their maker. Today, we regularly hear of the struggles between those vying for political power and authority. Seldom is it pretty. During political campaigning, Many observers talk of the abuse of power and authority. If power is the ability to influence people and events, 
it is crucial that those who exercise it also enjoy the authority that justifies them in what they do. For many people, particularly those who have suffered under despotic regimes, power is associated with force and compulsion and violence. The power that identifies itself only with force makes victims of its subject. People will eventually and rightly oppose a power that is overbearing, arrogant and officious. On the other hand, we know that power need not be destructive. Real authority can sometimes be clothed in gentleness and sensitivity, as with exemplary Christians like Dame Cecily Saunders, founder of the hospice movement, and Brother Roger, the founder of Tezi. Martin Luther King and Archbishop Romero used the power of nonviolence to oppose injustice and suppression. Their moral authority, rooted in scripture and in Jesus' teaching, made them forces for good. People still look to their example, and so their legacy lives on. When Jesus began teaching, something happened. It made a deep impression. Although there is no specific detail in this morning's gospel as to what stirred such a reaction, it is clearly not a matter of Jesus' words just decorating the air. Verse 27. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. In this, his first public work of ministry, what is really happening is a confrontation between the two superpowers, the power of God and the power of darkness. We heard that while teacher Jesus was teaching, he was interrupted by the shouts of a man possessed, a man who had no authority over his body or spirit. The bitter irony, of course, is that he was the one who recognised Jesus. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. When Jesus spoke, he commanded the evil power that dominated the man's life to leave him. The man was thus transformed and freed. No wonder people were astonished and marvelled. Jesus used his power to liberate people from the evil forces that dominated their lives. And when others saw what Jesus was doing with his authority, they had to ask themselves who this Jesus really was. Verse 27, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus seems to meet with unalloyed approval and success. You can almost hear the applause. Verse 28. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. But later, as we all know, things will change and the applause will fade away. Jesus' teaching can disturb us, shake us up, make us ask difficult questions of ourselves. When Jesus' teaching becomes too demanding, people can distract themselves by focusing on peripherals. For example, Jesus' background. Can any good come out of Nazareth? Or his family? Is not this the carpenter's son? They will question his authority. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority anyway? The important point is that Jesus is committed to using his power for our ultimate good. Jesus acts and speaks words that bring fresh order into the world. It is creative, restoring and healing. He is putting into effect the kingdom of God and its values, not by love of power, but by the power of love, not by the foolish power of tyrants, but by the powerful contradiction of being a servant king. Jesus is modelling what a servant ministry looks like. He will continue to exercise his authority to liberate those who are bound up and to confront those who lay burdens on the weak. Applause or no applause, Jesus works on in God's name, as must we. And what about us? 
If we are to have any influence, power or authority in bringing kingdom value to our communities, values of justice, peace, love, reconciliation, we, like Jesus, must be grounded in the Word of God, looking always to God the Father for guidance about how we might use any authority or power invested in us. And we can begin right now in small ways, praying about mending broken relationships, listening without judging, speaking kind words, and most importantly, opening ourselves every day to God's word and to that still small voice. We then become more and more true servants of God from whom all power and authority come. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the light of Christ shines amid the darkness of our world, and that the darkness has not overcome it. We pray that his light may shine in our lives, may teach us through the church with the knowledge of truth, enabling us to walk in the way of holiness and love. We pray for people across the world living in fear and want, or oppressed by war or violence. Lighten their darkness and bless the peacemakers, the food bringers and the comforters. Liberator God, your promise is freedom to captives. Free us from complacency and empower us to resist evil and seek the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill, and we remember before you our rector Graham this morning, and for those suffering in mind or spirit, particularly during this period of lockdown. Bless those cast down by the cares and sorrows of daily life, those facing long and incurable illness, those who have lost their faith, 
and for whom the future is dark. In your mercy maintain their courage, lift their burdens and renew their faith. God of hope, we ask you a blessing on all young people whose learning has been disrupted. Thank you for their energy and potential. Bless their resilience. Keep them and shine your face upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died, for those who have passed away because of the COVID pandemic, perhaps alone without loved ones round about. May their memories be cherished. We remember Joanna Cameron this morning, who died this week, and we pray for her family. Lord of life, look with compassion on those who grieve. May they know that you are with them even in the darkest hours. And in your presence may they find courage, comfort and peace for your love's sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church family of St John's Perth as we celebrate together the 100th birthday of Mr Ernie Holmes, our oldest living member. We give thanks for Ernie's life and witness and for his dedication and faithfulness over the years. Thank you for Ernie's distinguished war service in the RAF and for the noble principles he has lived by throughout his life. May your blessing be upon him today and all who live alongside him in Kincarathy Nursing Home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we step into this new day, which lies open before us, may our thanks and praise give joy to the living God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now a final blessing. Christ, the Son of God, gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. And now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.